get to continue on in the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest preaching message from the greatest preacher to ever live. We are walking slowly through this because there is so much here. Uh, Last week, if you were out, we covered the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are so important because they lay the foundation of everything that Jesus says in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are, blessed are. God is saying you're blessed if you are these things. And the first thing says, in order to be blessed, you must be poor in spirit, meaning you must realize that you're a sinner, that you are separated from God. And because of that, you mourn. You mourn over your sin. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those that are merciful, that are pure in heart, that are peacekeepers. And blessed are the persecuted. So Jesus, from the very beginning, says, here's what it takes to be in my kingdom. you got to understand your sin. you got to understand that sin is a separation from a holy God. And then, once you come to saving faith in Christ, these other things are an outpouring of that. Meekness, humbleness, self-control, being peacekeepers, and on and on and on. And I love how Jesus starts out with the positive. Blessed are. Blessed are, blessed are, you're blessed if you're in me, because I'm just here to say, the rest of this sermon is tough. <laughs> it's very challenging. He, he does not um, make it easy in this world. I'll say that, as we're going to see from our passage today. But the Beatitudes are what a Christian's character are to be about. That's what the Christian's character are to be about. And today, we're going to study the famous salt and light passage, and this describes a Christian's influence in the culture. So once we are followers of Christ, here's what we are to do to influence a culture that is unsalty and that is dark. So I, I just, by for pure curiosity, what is influencing our culture? So I Googled, what are the top 10 influencers in our world today? Here they are. These aren't going to surprise you. Number one, Cristiano Ronaldo, 733 million followers on social media. Selena Gomez, 554 million. Leo Messi, my son's favorite soccer player, 500 million. Kylie Jenner, 495 million. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, 488 million. Kim Kardashian, 448 million. Justin Bieber, 431 million. Ariana Grande, 425 million. Taylor Swift, 402 million. Katy Perry, 320 million. Now, these aren't shocking to us, but I'm here to tell us this, this group are the influencers in our world. Should it be shocking to us that it's in the state that it is? I think not. That is why Jesus' Sermon on the Mount about how we as Christians are to be influencers in this world are as important today, you could argue more important today, than they were in the first century. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is needed by every single one of us, Christians and non-Christians alike. So... Let me pray for us, and we're going to dive into this text with God's help. Heavenly Father, as we study Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20, I just pray that you would work. God, that you would help us to be attentive to your word, that you would help us to be laser-focused and locked in on what your word is teaching us through this Sermon on the Mount. So God, guide and direct every syllable that I speak, guide and direct each and every heart that's here, for G- in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, starting in verse 13, it says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, I just want to stop right there for a minute. Because for you and I, when we hear that, it's a, a little weird. Like, we don't start out conversations that way. Hey, are, have you been salt this week? But in the first century, it had a whole different meaning. It had a whole different context. So, I did a little research on salt. They claim that there's 14,000 usages for salt. And my dog was laying on the ground as I was studying this, and I looked at him and I said, I don't know that you have five usages. And salt has 14,000. He just looked at me like I was speaking Hebrew. But anyway, so 
Some of the, some of the key uses is for salt. It's to season food. I, I bet we have a hundred salt shakers in the kitchen. Would that be right, hospitality team? More? Okay. There's a lot. But we do that. We, we don't go anywhere and eat where there's not salt on the table. That's, that's what it is. It's used to season food. By the way, some of you use way too much salt. You need to dial it back. The second thing is it's used as a food preservative. And remember, first century, no electricity. There was not refrigerators. There were no freezers that you could just plug in to keep meat uh, with to keep meat good for long periods of time. What they did was they would pack it full of salt. They would take their meat and just smother it with salt, and it was a preservative. Uh, meat would keep for long, long periods of time just because of the preservative nature in salt. Uh, it was a very expensive and desired commodity in those days. It was referred to as white gold. Uh, wars were fought over salt. Uh, the Roman soldiers, uh, they used to pay them in salt. And it, it's interesting, the Latin word for salt, which is what the Romans would have spoke, the Latin language, is solarium. Solarium, it means of salt. That's where we get our word salary from. So if you've ever heard the phrase, you're not worth your weight in salt, that's where it comes from. Meaning, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing as an employee. You're not earning your wage. Um, take that with a grain of salt. We've all heard that. It's all these phrases that come from that period where salt was a very rare and desired commodity. Salt's also used as a fuel purifier. It draws moisture out of jet fuel. Uh, it's essential for help, for, for health. Uh, excuse me. But every cell in the human body contains some salt content. The World Health Organization recommends an intake of five grams of salt per day. Uh, and, and too much salt is bad. Research shows that 80% of heart attacks could be avoided if they would have had less salt intake. So that was a staggering, staggering statistic. It's used to de-ice, de to, to melt snow in the wintertime, snow and ice in the wintertime. It lowers the melting point of ice, but it raises the boiling point of water. I'm like, I have no idea how all of this works, but that's what salt does. It's a good antiseptic. And maybe best of all, it's used to kill poison ivy. So there you go. So salt has all of these attributes, qualities, usefulness to it. So when Jesus stands up on the mountainside just north of the Sea of Galilee and says, you disciples, you Christians are the salt of the earth, they would have got it. So that's what Jesus is telling them. You are to be a preservative in a decaying in dark world. You are to preserve what's holy, right, and true. And then Jesus goes on to say, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's interesting. Salt on its own in its purest form does not decay. It does not lose its saltiness. You know how salt loses saltiness? It's introduced to outside influences. Let that sink in for a minute. It's introduced to other minerals and other moisture contents. And it slowly, when it does that, it slowly diminishes its usefulness. And the same is true for us today. When we are not daily walking with Christ, when we are absorbing what the world is throwing at us, that's what Jesus is saying. You're losing your usefulness for the gospel. You're allowing outside influences to, to just... Uh, undermine what God wants for your life. Salt on its own does not lose its flavor. It's an amazing thing. Uh, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 9 and verse 40, this is Jesus speaking. It says, salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So Mark is associating being at peace with one another to being salty. Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. What did Jesus just say? Blessed are the peacemakers, the peacekeepers. 
Paul in the letter to the Colossians in chapter 4, verse 5, it says, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. And here it is. This is the challenging part. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. You ever been in a situation where you retaliate in a conversation immediately without allowing your conversation to be graceful and seasoned with salt? Done it a hundred times. Regretted it a hundred times. That is what Paul is saying. Let's be salt. Let's be graceful. Let's be peacekeepers. Let's allow, the, let's be the salt of the earth. So what happens when salt becomes tasteless? Let's look at the end of verse 13. It says, uh, when, when it becomes tasteless, it is no longer good for anything. We could just stop there. When we become unsalty, when we become unimpactful in a world that is lost and dying and on a one-way train to separation with God, when we become non-influential, you no longer do good for anything, Jesus says, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. That's not a good thing to be. That is not good at all. So a question, each of you here today, how would you describe your level of saltiness, your level of influence in this world? If, if you were to pick between 0 and 100, what is your influence for the gospel? What is your influence in your family for truth, for God's word? And what kind of an impact and influence is that having on the people around you? Take inventory of your life. How are you doing with being salt in a decaying world? Secondly, Jesus gives us this illustration of light. Then he says, you are the light of the world. Now, again, this is the only time that Jesus uses these metaphors to describe his followers. In all of the Gospels, it's, this is it, salt and light. That's the only one. So you are the light of the world. Facts about light. Most light is not even visible by the human eye. Some animals and insects can see parts of the light spectrum that humans can't. Microwaves, radio waves, x-ray machines all use rays of light in some form to operate. Light moves at 186,282 miles per second. Eyeglasses work just simply by bending light rays so that your eyes can focus differently. Light is mentioned 250 times in the Bible. Think we should understand light? We better. And light is a good disinfectant. Remember during the COVID days? I know we all tried to blot that out of our system. But they said, go outside. Meet outside because ultraviolet light rays from the sun can help kill the coronavirus. And now they're figuring out light has all kinds of useful things with dermatology and, and all this stuff. So light is a powerful technology that we're just now tapping into. But the bottom line to all of this, when Jesus says, you disciples, you Christians are to be the light of the world. What he is saying is it's dark out there. It's dark out there. And if you are not a light in a dark world, they're never going to know the truth. They're going to remain in the darkness. And if they remain in the darkness, they're going to remain separated from God for eternity. So that's what Jesus is saying. You're the light of the world, church. Let's be a light. Verse 14 goes on. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. I mean, this I don't even need to be up here. This stuff preaches itself. A city on a hill. What I love about First Baptist Church in Baser, Kansas, we are the most visible church in the whole town, you could argue. We're right along. I'm ready for this construction to be done, by the way. I don't know. Email the city. Don't do that. Don't email the city. They're doing a great job. They're working hard. But I'm ready for this construction to be done because a, a lot of traffic. We're the most visible church. It's like in 1975 or whenever this church voted to purchase this land, God was in it because they knew that this was a prime location to do gospel ministry in. 
So I am thankful for our charter members that God gave the vision to of this place. This building we're in now was built in 1980. Next year, in 2025, we're going to celebrate 100 years of gospel ministry in this town. It's going to be an amazing time of celebrating 100 years of what God has done here. But a city on a hill cannot be hidden. We, we need to be what God has called us to be, a light in this community, first and foremost. We have a great responsibility. Verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. I love, Jesus is like, disciples, you, you don't light a lamp and then cover it up. What good is that? But you put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Remember, first century, no electricity. They didn't have a light switch to flip, and lights just came on. They had to put lamps on lampstands, and if you covered them up, it was dark, but if you let them burn, it would light the house up. I love Christmas Eve candlelight. It's at night. Everything is dark. We turn every single light in this building off, and it starts with one little flame. And, and then you can, the darkness is broken just a slight amount. You can see enough to light the next candle and on and on and on. And then we have 340 some candles going in here. And it's like noon. It, it's amazing. And that's what Jesus is saying here. That is what we are to be in a, in a lost world. If we're out there in our community and there's one candle burning, it's not going to go very far. Each and every one of us should let our light shine. And this notion of, um, um, well, let me tell you what the Gospel of John says. The Apostle John records this in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Speaking of light, it says, In him was life. It, him is capitalized. This is a direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. In him was life, and the life was the light, capital L, a direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And, in, and the light, or the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't comprehend it. Remember what Jesus just said, blessed are the persecuted. He knows that there's going to be persecution. He knows that we're not just going to go out and everyone's going to fall to their knees and accept Jesus Christ when we open our mouth and evangelize them. That's not, it says the darkness does not comprehend it. They're going to persecute us, but it doesn't mean we should not go and shine our light in our community. John in chapter three goes on and says, this is the judgment that the light, capital L, Jesus Christ has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. They love the darkness rather than Christ for their deeds were evil for everyone who does evil hates the light. And does not come to the light for fear of his deeds being exposed. Friends, I'm here to say, when we sin, we if you are a Christian, if you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, when you sin, you feel it. You come under conviction. That's what it is. It's the, it's the exposing of our sin. We don't want to be revealed in the light. And that's what John is saying here. But in verse 21, it says, but he who practices the truth comes to the light. Meaning, when we sin, we can come to Christ, and he promises to forgive us. So that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. What a powerful verse. And then lastly, in John chapter 8, he just keeps hammering home the fact about this light. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I love how the Apostle John is just so clear on this. And then back to the Sermon on the Mount in verse 15. He said, Jesus says, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. So practical revelation for us today. How well is your light shining? Do you got a basket? Do you got a five-gallon five gallon bucket over your light? Are you being quiet when you should speak up in certain situations? Are you going along with the crowd? It's so easy to do, but Jesus is saying, don't cover up your light. 
Are you ignoring the needs of others right around you? Don't cover up your light. Let it shine. And I can't help but read this and make note of in verse 15 there when Jesus says, but put it on a lampstand. Because Revelation has some powerful language about the lampstand. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, it gives this vision, Jesus gives this vision to John about these seven lampstands. And these seven lampstands represent the seven churches of the day, the seven churches in that region. So a lampstand represents the church. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 6, Jesus is speaking to the church at Ephesus here. And listen to what it says, church. Therefore, remember where you have fallen. He's rebuking the church at Ephesus for not shining their light. Remember where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. And here's the warning. Or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Hundreds of churches are closing their doors every month in our nation. Because they refuse to be a light in a dark world for whatever reason. Let that not be said of us, church. Verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine. And it doesn't say, let your light shine so that they can see your good works and glorify you. (laughs) That's not why we do this. We don't let our light shine to bring self-glorification to us. That is a dangerous place to be. God will humble you. (laughs) But let your light shine so that you can bring glory to God the Father, so that you can bring glory to Jesus Christ and bring glory to the Holy Spirit. All the glory goes to God. So in verse 17, as we look here, it's this break. In verses 17 through 20, Jesus completely switches gears. He goes from be the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, to now we see the law. In verse 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So remember the audience. Matthew is teaching to a Jewish audience. All they have ever known their entire life is the law, the Ten Commandments. How good can my works be? So Jesus is showing up on the scene here saying, look, Jewish audience, I did not come to abolish that. I came to fulfill it. And Matthew actually talks about this in chapter 1, in verse 21. And, and, And it goes like this. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, here it is. Now, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. He's, Matthew is hammering home the fact that Jesus is speaking to the Jewish audience saying, look, all that stuff, Jesus didn't come to make it obsolete. He came to fulfill it. There is a new day. No longer is murder the sin. It is anger in your heart that's the sin. No longer is adultery the sin. Looking at a woman in lust is now the sin. Jesus is turning this world upside down with with his sermon here. And then in Colossians chapter 2, Paul hits home on this. It says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink. Praise God, by the way. We can have seafood steak, and bacon, all in the same meal. It's the greatest thing. Do not let anybody be your judge in regard to food or drink, but in respect, but or in respect to festival or new moon or the Sabbath day. There are, com- there are entire denominations that still meet on the Sabbath, and Paul's words here could not be clearer. Don't let them judge you about these things, because here's verse 17 in Colossians chapter 2. This is where it is. Those things which were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. That's what Paul is telling us. That's what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Look, I didn't come to abolish the law. God's moral law, 
hear me here. God's moral law never changes. God never changes. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not abolish it. His moral law never changes. Look at verse 18. Jesus continues on with this thought process. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it's all accomplished. Jesus is saying, look, Jewish people, Believe Jewish people, not the smallest letter from the Torah, not the smallest letter from the entire Old Testament uh, shall pass away until it is all accomplished. Some of your translations say a jot or a tittle. I feel weird saying that word up here, but that's what the King James says. Jot or tittle. What are these things? A jot is the tenth letter in the Hebrew language. It's the smallest of the whole alphabet. A stroke or a tittle is a tiny little pin mark that differentiates different Hebrew letters. To you and I, we wouldn't even notice it if we were reading Hebrew. It's it's the smallest thing. What Jesus is saying, the the words that were recorded through Moses from Genesis all the way to Malachi through the prophets, every single word of God's word is relevant. That's why we study the Old Testament. That's why we study all of the law and the prophets, because they are useful. Jesus is saying all of God's word, every single letter to the tiniest little mark is relevant. God has spoken, (laughs) and his words have been recorded and written down with 1,000% accuracy, and all of it is useful. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 It says this about the Old Testament and the New Testament, but mainly regarding the Old Testament. This is what Paul's words to Timothy are. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. Jesus is saying we need the Old Testament. We need every single word. And then in verse 19, he goes on to say, Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of God. Meaning, don't mess with the scriptures. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We take it very seriously who teaches God's word here. From preschool all the way up to senior adults. Because we know it's a high calling. It is something that we cannot take lightly. And Jesus is saying we must know the whole counsel of God. Nothing should be annulled, it says. That means to break or to be broken, to destroy. None of God's word should do that. And then in verse 20 it says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we come to this verse. And it's like, what is he talking about here? But remember, put yourself in first century context. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were the bomb. They were the highest members of Scripture. They, you would not catch a Pharisee sinning, okay? They were looked at as the religious elite. So all of the rest of Jewish society would look at these folks with rose-colored glasses, like they're the greatest in the kingdom of God. So hearing this, Jesus say, uh, unless your righteousness surpasses them, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is hitting them to the core. This is shaking them to the very roots. They're, in their minds, they're thinking, there's nothing that I can do to reach that level of righteousness. And Jesus is sitting there saying, you get it. That's the whole point. There is nothing that you can do to reach the level of righteousness that you can attain for yourself before a holy God. The only way to achieve righteousness is to be covered by the blood of the Lamb, the perfect sacrifice that fulfilled all of the Old Testament sacrificial system with a once and for all total covering of sin for those that repent and believe in the name of Jesus. That is what clothed in righteousness means. We can't do it on our own. There's no task we can do. You don't have to clean yourself up before coming to Christ. It's simply repenting and believing that Jesus is the Christ. 
Okay, we just covered a lot of stuff. A lot. There is so much here. And I just want to reiterate, study this on your own, church. Dive into this stuff. There is so much here. Text each other during the week. Like, hold each other accountable. What did this passage mean? What did that passage mean? That's how we grow together as, an, as a community. So, verses 13 through 20. How can we bundle this up so that we can take it out of this room and it be useful for us today? How are we to be salt and alert? And, and light in this world. So here's the first thing. The church should look very different than the world around us. Okay? <laughs> I pray that if you are a person here that has never surrendered your life to Christ, you're thinking, these people are a little weird. <laughs> I hope you think that because we should be different than the world. I hope that our church is different than the list of 10 Social media influencers that I read at the beginning. There should be a direct contrast between that world and what the church is. It should look completely different. And that's why we do all the things that we do. The impact events to be an influence in our society. We deliver these little desserts to new families that move into our neighborhood just to say, welcome to Baser. We're here if you need anything at all. We, we love being in the schools and buying our teachers breakfast and coffee. We love being a host for a homeschool co-op that meets here. We love being a host for a preschool that meets Monday through Friday right below your feet in the basement. We love being involved in the public square. We love that we have people coming here that are involved in politics. Right, Vanessa? <laughs> like, that is how we influence and make a difference in our society. Because if we don't, someone will. And let me remind you of their names, okay? Where are they? Selena Gomez, Kim Kardashian, Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift. For crying out loud, we must be an influence in our world because they are going the opposite direction. Okay, here's the other thing. Salt and light, they completely change whatever it is they're introduced to. The smallest spark of light can dispel the darkness. A little bit of salt can make your green beans taste great. <laughs> but they ch completely change whatever it is. It's not, Jesus is not saying you need to go home and you need to contact your financial advisor and you need to sell everything you have and move to Guatemala. Like Jesus is saying where you are right now, how are you doing with being salt and light? How are you doing? Your faith is not just about you too. And, and this hit home for me today. It's not just for you to hold tightly to and keep it inside you. There, there is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian in terms of the New Testament. That is not a thing. Consistently not coming to church is not a good and healthy thing for you if you are a believer. The world will influence you. Salt and light cannot go unnoticed when they are introduced. Listen to what Paul says. This is the last scripture we're going to cover this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. This kind of drives it all home here. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ you will have reason to glorify, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. And friends, it starts in your very home. All of this starts with the family. Every single thing. If, if we are not being salt and light with our very basic inner circle, we're failing. We must be salt and light in our very home first. And then it trickles out, out of our homes. It trickles into the church. Then it trickles out of the church and into the neighborhoods around us and into the town and then into our state and then into our nation and then into the world. Jesus did not mince his words when he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. 
It doesn't mean that you and I have to go to every single person in the world, but we can in our circle of influence where God has placed us. And I just want to close with this, that Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. So Christian, these are our marching orders to be salt and light. But I just have to ask if there's one here today, if you have never believed in the one in which eternal life is found, it's not possible to be the salt and the life that Jesus is talking about here. So if you're here today and you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, would you do that today? If he is drawing near to you, don't wait. He would love to have you come home today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the challenging passages in the scripture of being salt and light. And Lord, I pray that each person here, each person here, takes a spiritual inventory of their life. God, how effective and how influential am I being, number one, in my home? Number two, in my circle of friends? Number three, in the community? Lord, how are we doing with being that salt and light? How are we doing with serving in the local church? How are we doing with loving the people? And God, I just pray too that if there's one here that doesn't know you, that has never bent their knee and surrendered their life to you, that today would be the day of salvation. Your word is so clear that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf when we were dead in our trespasses. You made a way when there was no way. So, Lord, we rejoice in that. That's why we gather. That's why we're here to worship you and to thank you for what you've done. Be with us today, Lord, in Jesus' name.